Bill Smoot grew up in Kentucky and attended Purdue University, where he was the editor of the campus newspaper. Uh, no stranger to controversy, he was fired by the university president and then reinstated after there were protests by students and faculty. He went on to graduate school at the University of uh, at Northwestern University, where he received a PhD in philosophy. He has taught for nearly 40 years at levels ranging from sixth grade through university. In his wonderful book, Conversations with Teachers, Dr. Smoot interviews great teachers to find out how they teach and what really happens between great teachers and students to make learning happen. He is also a photographer and a writer of short stories. I am so pleased to present Bill Smoot. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. This, this is a great group. I want to join one of these uh, in Berkeley. And thank you for the introduction. I didn't know you were going to dig out my FBI file, uh, but um, yeah, I've been a teacher all my life, as you heard. And when I was in graduate school in Chicago, I discovered the work of Studs Terkel. How many of you have ever read a book by Terkel? Oh, great. So as you know, he wrote books of interviews uh, with people in all sorts of areas. He did a book of interviews with people about their memories of the Great Depression, another their memories of World War II. Uh, the one that was on the bestseller list for a long time was called Working, just a book of interviews with people about their jobs. And over the years, I always thought I was a, a great fan of his and felt like I I learned more about American society by reading his books than I did any number of sociology texts. And over the years, I used to think, you know, I bet someday he's going to do a book of interviews with teachers, and I can't wait. And then at one point, I read that he was in failing health, and uh, he's since passed away. Um, and so at some point, I thought, what if I were to just try that myself? And I think at that point, uh, the voice of my late mother sounded in my head. One of her favorite sayings was, if you really want something done, do it yourself. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. I'll do a few interviews and see how they go and see if I find them interesting. And so I did a few interviews, and I was hooked. I, I thought they were fascinating. And so I, I set out to do a book of interviews with great teachers. The one uh, change I made after the initial idea is originally I thought, well, I'll interview school teachers, first grade through the university level. And I did that, and they are probably half of the interviews in the book. But it occurred to me at some point that everything that gets done in a society, from tying your shoes to performing brain surgery, has to be taught. That the teaching learning process is kind of the glue in a way that holds any society together. And so I branched out. And so by the time the book was finished, I had interviewed a teacher of exotic dancers, uh, a teacher of the art of alligator wrestling, uh, a major league baseball manager who's known for his ability to teach his players how to play the infield. That's Ron Washington. Uh, a teacher of race car drivers, uh, one of the great pastry chefs of the world who teaches at the American Culinary Institute, um, and a, a variety of... Do something about it. They feel sad if they feel that goal failure is irrevocable. Then, once evoked, emotions provoke further thoughts and actions that are directed towards savoring, reversing, or adjusting to these changes in the status of their goals. These thoughts and appraisals, in turn, shape subsequent events and um, subsequent appraisals. So according to this view, then, the point is that emotion and cognition are really closely interwoven with each depending on the other. Now, that's all well and good for us as adults, but what about infants? 
Infants are certainly emotional, and they certainly, unlike this one, don't seem to be spending a lot of time mulling over the way that events relate to their goals. <laughs> but if emotion and cognition are truly interdependent, we ought to see emotion, infants' emotions changing in tandem with their cognitive development. So researchers have developed um, coding systems for facial expressions of emotion. And using these systems, they, can, um, they look at movements in the brow region, the eye region, and the mouth region, and they can reliably distinguish between expressions of distress, sadness, anger, fear, and, of course, happiness. And these tools, along with some clever experiments that researchers have done, give us a window onto how infants' emotional experience changes over the course of development and how those emotional changes are linked to their cognitive development. So in the uh, first month of life, one sees emotional expressions primarily of pleasure and distress in response to a wide range of stimuli. Uh, for example, infants express pleasure at being warm and fed, distress at being hungry or, or in pain. And these expressions seem to be primarily tied to the infant's own bodily state. Infants also show emotional expressions that have a more reflex-like quality. For example, if you put a, um, a drop of something bitter or acidic on a baby's tongue, you get a disgust expression. But these are in response to very specific stimuli. Um, so then in the second month of life, infants become increasingly responsive to external stimuli, and researchers start to see more frequent expressions of interest, alertness, and by the end of the second month of life, you see what every parent eagerly waits for, and that's the social smile. Two-month-old infants will smile in response to visual images and in particular, faces. And researchers believe that infants are now showing pleasure and distress, not just in response to their bodily state, but in response to a mental process, their ability to recognize or not recognize information in the environment. Now, I know that that sounds a bit cold-hearted, but the reason researchers believe this is because infants don't tend to smile the first time you present an image, but only after several repetitions. And immediately before a smile happens, you often see this furrowing of the brow, which is a sign of effort, attention. If you show an infant something that's too discrepant from what they're familiar with, that furrowing of the brow kind of resolves into a distress expression. Whereas if it's familiar, the baby, it relaxes into a smile. So at least by the second month of life then, we're already seeing emotions in response to a cognitive process, recognizing information in the environment. Around uh, six to 12 months, you see another development in the cognitive sphere, and that is that babies can coordinate their actions in order to achieve goals. Now, in order to have a goal, the baby has to keep a mental representation in working memory, okay? That is, they have to be able to represent a state that doesn't currently exist, like that toy in my hand, okay? They have to keep that in working memory while they coordinate all the actions necessary to achieve it. So goal-directed action is a pretty important achievement for infants, and at the same time that infants show this achievement in their ordinary lives, they're also showing, remarkably, new facial expressions of emotion. For the first time, at around six months of age, you regularly see expressions of sadness, anger, fear, in appropriate situations. Now, to understand why, think about the cognitive prerequisites that are necessary to feel the very simple emotion of distress. To feel distress, you only need to not like the state you're in, okay? I'm hungry, I'm cold, I'm wet. You don't have to have any kind of representation of some other state that you'd like to be in. Um, 
But feeling angry is another thing. Um, <laughs> it depends on an understanding that there's something you want and there's someone or something preventing you from getting it. So anger is a more complex emotion than distress. So to study the development of anger and sadness, researchers have harassed babies in a whole variety of ways, like videotaping them when they're getting their routine inoculations, restraining their arms at their sides, and yes, even pulling pacifiers out of their mouths. Um, and what they find is that babies tend to react before about six months of age when, when uh, babies experience these insults, they tend to react with expressions of distress. After about six months of age, you see more and more expressions of sadness and anger. Researchers think that this is related to the development of the infant's ability to engage in goal-directed action. And why do they think this? Well, a researcher by the name of Michael Lewis ought to get a prize for getting babies ticked off earlier in life than anybody else. <laughs> what Lewis did was he set up an experimental task that made it really easy for babies to keep a goal in mind and to coordinate action to achieve it. Had the baby seated in an infant chair, a string around the baby's wrist, every time the baby moved its arm, they see a picture of a smiling face on a slide in front of them and hear a snippet of the theme song of Sesame Street. So they very quickly learned the contingency between their arm moves and this wonderful result, and they smile. Then what Lewis did is he simply pulled the plug. He got expressions of anger at two months. <laughs> And it was those babies, <laughs> those babies who looked angry were the ones that were pulling harder and faster on the string in order to make that image and that sound come back. So anger involves frustration of a goal. And if you reduce the memory burden and the need for infants to coordinate lots of actions in order to achieve a goal, you see expressions of anger much earlier. Now, there's another set of cognitive competencies that emerges at about 15 months of age, um, and that is self-awareness and standards. Toddlers now understand that people have expectations for their actions that they can either meet or fail to meet. And with these new cognitive competencies comes a whole new set of emotional expressions. And that's what's called the self-conscious emotions, shame, guilt, pride, embarrassment. So far, the relationship between emotion and cognition sounds kind of one-sided. But it actually works both ways. Emotions don't just depend on cognitive abilities, they also promote them. For instance, when a baby finds something engaging and smiles and laughs, parents feel great, and they're really motivated to keep doing whatever it is they were doing. On the other hand, if they do something and it's too intense and the baby cries, they, they get upset and they're really motivated to stop it. So emotions, both the parents and the child, promotes cognitive development. They encourage an environment that's filled with interesting events that are right about the perfect level of complexity um, for the infant or young child to process. So the answer to the first question then is definitely yes. There are normative changes in emotional experience that infants and children go through. And Consistent with the view that emotion and cognition are interwoven, they're interdependent processes, these changes in emotion occur in a relatively fixed sequence as infants and young toddlers become capable of increasingly complex appraisals of events. Now, there are also deliberate ways to change emotions that vary from situation to situation and from person to person. And so our second question is, which of these strategies 
are young children capable of using? Since people feel emotions when they appraise events as relevant to their goals, they can deliberately intervene in this process in a couple of different ways. Clearly, they can uh, change the environment through their behavior to get what they want, or they can change their appraisals, a cognitive process. But using a cognitive strategy to change emotions presupposes an understanding that thoughts and goals influence your emotional responses. And so the question is, do young children have a complex enough understanding of their own minds and other people's minds to be able to do this? And many researchers actually say no. Um, for instance, in one study, researchers asked children, suppose that there's a young boy and he's lying alone in bed and he's feeling okay, but he wants to feel happy. How can he feel happy without leaving the bed or doing anything? Now, most eight-year-olds and all adults said the boy could think about something happy, but only two of the five-year-olds tested did. And the rest of them just simply ignored the instructions <laughs> and came up with some behavior the kid could engage in, like he'd go off and play. Now, there have been a number of different studies like this, and they all kind of tell the same story, and they've contributed to a growing cons consensus that until middle childhood, kids don't understand that you can change emotions simply by changing thoughts and goals. But, what's that? <laughs> a lot of adults don't understand it either. <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> but it seemed to me and to some of my colleagues that you know several of these studies are asking kids about pretty unfamiliar situations. Like how often do you like lie in bed and think, oh, I want to be happy? And if we're given the choice, who wouldn't prefer to change an external situation directly rather than change the way you think about it? So my colleagues and I hypothesized that young children may have a much more sophisticated understanding of emotion regulation than is typically assumed. So to test this, um, we presented five and six-year-old children with very familiar situations like not being able to go outside and play or having to eat a food that they hate. Um, we asked the children whether the protagonists would feel mad or sad, and then what they could do to make their mad or sad feelings go away. And we didn't stop there. Uh, if they gave us a behavioral strategy, like, well, she'd throw the spinach on the floor, we'd say, okay, so if Tina couldn't throw her spinach on the floor, then what could she do to make her mad, or her mad feelings go away? And we also asked children about strategies that they'd used in their own lives at times that they felt sad, mad, and afraid. What we found was that over half of the children suggested at least one cognitive strategy to reduce negative emotion. And in fact, when they were describing their own personal experiences, cognitive strategies were the most frequent strategy children described. So, how do five and six-year-old children keep their cool? By changing thoughts. One child said she could forget about it. Another said, go to sleep, because when you sleep, you don't know if you have good days or bad. <laughs> I love that one. I, I, I actually totally endorse that strategy. Um, <laughs> and then another says he'll eat the thing he doesn't like, knowing that there's something he likes coming on. They also talk about changing goals. He decided he didn't want to go outside and play. Or she could try to like another thing instead. And this is my favorite, I think. By eating a little. If you thought that was a thing you didn't like and you ate a little, you might find you liked it. So our second question was, what strategies can young children deliberately use, use to deliberately change emotions? And in contrast to previous studies, um, we found that when children are asked about familiar events and given plenty of opportunities to show their knowledge, 
they give us some really surprisingly sophisticated strategies for changing emotional states. And they show a sophisticated understanding of the fact that thoughts and goals are related to emotions. So given that children are capable of using cognitive strategies around the time they start entering formal schooling, this raises the question of what kinds of strategies should they be encouraged to use? So our third question is, are there good strategies and bad strategies? And this is important because the effectiveness with which children regulate emotion has consequences, immediate consequences, for their learning and memory. It also has long-term consequences for adolescents' well-being. Why would emotion regulation affect children's learning and memory? We'll consider a typical situation where a child might engage in emotion regulation. There's a conflict on the playground. It's left him feeling sad, but now he's got to go back into the classroom and say, memorize state capitals. <laughs> Emotions are attention grabbers. They direct our attention to information that is immediately relevant to our well-being. And since attention is a limited resource, it pulls attention away from other kinds of information, like state capitals, that might turn out to be relevant to us in the long run. So a child who can regulate his feelings should have an intellectual advantage over someone whose emotions continue to commandeer their attention. Now this insight has led to scores of emotion education programs cropping up in schools. But what kinds of strategies should these programs teach? In addition to the distinction that we've talked about between behavioral strategies and cognitive strategies, you can make a rough distinction based on what the aim of the strategy is. Whether it's to disengage from emotion, or to work through it. Now, emotional disengagement refers to attempts to eliminate emotional expressions, thoughts, and feelings by suppressing them, by distracting oneself, or by using distancing. And it's actually often discouraged in emotion education programs and by clinicians. Emotional engagement, on the other hand, involves um, working through negative emotion, identifying emotion, what caused it, and coming up with constructive ways to act or to reinterpret the situation in a more positive light. And um, this is a central component of many emotion education programs in schools. So what's so bad about emotional disengagement. I mean, the Stoics were all for it. They argued that strong emotion interferes with rational thought, and they recommended using cognitive strategies for getting rid of them. For example, Marcus Aurelius wrote, if you're distressed by any external thing, it's not this thing which disturbs you, but your own judgment about it, and it's in your power to eliminate that judgment now. Now that might seem plausible, but recent research doesn't look so good for the Stoics. It turns out that trying to suppress emotional thoughts actually leads to a rebound effect where the frequency of those thoughts increases. And there's been research on adults that shows that, um, well, let me tell you a little bit about how these studies ran. Um, Richards and Gross showed people horrifying pictures. Before they saw the pictures, they were instructed to either suppress any expression of emotion, or to distract themselves, or to reappraise the images in a neutral or a positive light. And later they tested memory for the pictures. What they found was that suppressing emotion didn't make people feel any better, and it was effortful. It increased physiological arousal. It impaired people's memory for the images. Those who distracted themselves also showed impaired memory for the emotional information. In contrast, positive reappraisal 
um, thinking about the images in a positive or neutral way, uh, decreased negative emotion with no apparent physiological or memory costs. Okay, so disengagement, like suppression and distraction, impairs memory for emotional information, but that raises another question. What does it do to non-emotional information? We hypothesized that people might disengage from emotion by turning their attention away from what's out there that's emotional and to other aspects of the environment. If that's the case, then emotional disengagement strategies might actually promote memory for non-emotional information, like educational information. In contrast, working through emotions requires at least initially focusing on them. And this might actually pose the greater immediate threat to memory for non-emotional information. So to test this, um, we elicited a neutral emotional state or sadness in children, seven and 10-year-old children, by showing them scenes from the film The Champ. So everybody saw a neutral scene where the protagonist, Billy, gets ready for bed. Kids in the sad experimental conditions saw scenes where Billy's horse is injured and he's sobbing and his father is badly injured and he's crying. Um, then children received instructions in a question and answer format about how to regulate their emotions. Some of the children were given no regulation instructions at all. They were simply asked about the neutral scene. Others were given instructions to disengage. Forget about your sad feelings. Don't feel sad now. Don't let yourself make a sad face. Others were given emotional engagement strategies that helped children identify how they were feeling, why they were feeling that way, and then quickly moved on to strategies for making themselves feel better. Then we showed children a documentary film, an educational film, about a girl's visit to a uh, bread factory. And we tested children's memory for the educational film. And one final piece of the study was that we were interested in whether children might have tried to regulate their feelings of sadness to cope with those feelings while they were first watching the sad film before they got any instructions from us. So we simply asked them, was there anything you did or thought while watching the film to make, you, to make yourself feel better? Okay, so did feeling sad affect children's memory for educational information? To find out, we compared children uh, who had watched the neutral film versus the sad film when neither group got any emotion regulation instructions. And what we found is that watching the sad film impaired their memory for the educational information. They remembered less of that film about the visit to the bread factory. And this fits very well with the idea that negative emotion puts a demand on attention, and it shows how important it is to use effective emotion regulation strategies in the classroom. But the question is, which strategies are effective? So for the children who watched the sad film, what strategies worked best? As we predicted, children who were told to disengage, forget about your sad feelings, remembered more of the educational film than those who received no emotion regulation instructions. And they remembered more than children who had used emotional engagement, that is, working through feelings of sadness. And then children also told us what they might have done or thought while they were watching the sad film to cope with their feelings. And some children described cognitive disengagement strategies. Just stop thinking about it. I thought about my friends and how they're nice to me. It was just a movie and that's all. Others described cognitive engagement strategies such as positive reappraisal. I thought the horse would get better. Forget about the dad, but I had hopes for the horse. <laughs> um, 
And then there were kids who uh, described either behavioral strategies or no strategies at all. Um, for example, I tried to smile or I couldn't help it. I just kept feeling sad. Now, what were the consequences of these types of strategies for children's memory? Turned out, again, that those who used a cognitive disengagement strategy remembered more than those who had used a behavioral or no strategy. So to sum up, um, feeling sad impaired children's memory for educational information, and working through feelings of sadness didn't help, but instructing children to disengage did. And this is actually somewhat consistent with um, some research, recent research on adults, and we talked about this earlier before during breakfast, that if you start reappraising a negative situation after your emotional response is already well underway, turns out reappraisal can be effortful and it can take a lot of attention. In contrast, coaching children to suppress emotion enhance their memory for educational material. How? Children seem to have used cognitive disengagement strategies, distraction, thought suppression, distancing, and these strategies helped our little Stoics to be able to pay attention to the educational information. So our third question was, are there good strategies and bad strategies? And what we did here was to compare the immediate consequences for memory of disengaging from negative emotion, the bad strategies, versus uh, working through negative emotion, the more favored strategies. And against the odds in this short-term runoff, disengagement won. But what about long-term consequences of regulating emotion? Unfortunately, we don't know a lot about the long-term consequences of using different strategies, but we do know that people who report habitually engaging in positive reappraisal report greater well-being and greater happiness than people who say they use these strategies less often. In contrast, people who report suppressing their emotional expressions more often report more depression and less well-being. And we really don't know much about the long-term consequences of distraction at all. Why is reappraisal associated with greater well-being in the long term? Well, one potential downstream effect of emotion regulation strategies is their effect on the way people remember their past emotional responses. Memory for emotion is really important because we on a daily basis make decisions about what sorts of situations to seek out and what sorts of situations to avoid based on how we remember having felt in those situations in the past. But memory fades over time, and as it fades, people draw increasingly on their current appraisals of those past events to help them reconstruct how they must have felt. So as a result, some people end up remembering past stressful situations as more positive than they, what they originally experienced, and other people remember them as less positive than they originally experienced. My colleagues in, a, um, in Italy and I decided that we wanted to take a look at um, how adolescents regulated emotion during a stressful experience, and whether the strategies that they used later predicted how they remembered that experience. Um, we hypothesized that disengaging from emotion using suppression, distraction, doesn't really involve changing the way you're thinking about situations. So we didn't really think it would be associated with memory bias. But as the name implies, positive reappraisal involves reframing a negative situation in a positive light, thinking about what, could, what good could come out of this. And as a result, we thought that as people are looking back on stressful experiences, that's gonna bias their memory, and they're gonna remember them as more positive than they actually were. 
So to test this, we turn to students in Italy, high school students who are right in the midst of preparing for their exit exam. Um, and uh, this is a really stressful rite of passage. It's, uh, uh, you have to pass the exam in order to go on to college and, or the university. It involves a lengthy written section, uh, oral section in front of a board of strange professors, and we're really scary. Um, so what we did was three weeks before the exam, we asked the students how they were feeling, how happy, curious, anxious, sad, angry, and bored they felt. And they also rated how much they were just engaging in distraction. I try to take my mind off the exam, suppression, I try not to show how I feel, reappraisal, I try to see the positive aspects of this experience. Then, shortly after exam grades were posted, and again six months later, we asked the students to remember how they'd been feeling while they were in the midst of preparing for the exam. And this table summarizes how adolescents' emotion regulation strategies were related to their memory for, emo for emotion three weeks and six months after the exam. To figure out if memory for emotion was overestimated, underestimated, or accurate, we compared what they remembered to what they initially felt. So we were interested in the bias, the ways that these things were different. And we controlled for other things that might affect memory, like how well they did on the exam. Now, in contrast to our prediction, what we found was that disengagement strategies, distraction, and suppression actually were associated with a negative bias in memory for emotion. That is, the more adolescents used distraction, the less anxious they remembered having felt three weeks after the exam. That seems like a good thing. But when they recalled their emotions six months after the exam, greater use of distraction was associated with recalling less happiness and curiosity than the initially reported, and more uh, boredom. Suppression was associated with remembering less, having felt less happy than they initially said they were, but this effect was transient. As we predicted, though, the more students engaged in positive reappraisal before the exam, the happier they remembered feeling three weeks later after the exam, the more curiosity they remembered, and the less sadness and anger they remembered. And six months after the exam, they were still remembering themselves as having felt more happy than they reported. So researchers have found that uh, people who habitually reappraise experience greater well-being than those who reappraise less, and what might contribute to this greater well-being? Well, the novelist Rita Mae Brown once said that one of the keys to happiness <laughs> is a bad memory. <laughs> Our findings are completely consistent with this. Uh, <laughs> The more adolescents reappraised during a stressful experience, the more of a positive bias they later showed when remembering how they felt. Now, usually we think of memory bias or distortion as a bad thing. But when you think about it, the primary function of memory for emotion is probably not to keep this exact record of past experience, but instead to guide our future behavior. And so a positive bias in memory for emotion, remembering stressful events as having been not so bad, should contribute to reappraisers' greater well-being and their willingness to take on new challenges. So returning then to the question of good and bad strategies. The short-term and long-term consequences of emotion regulation strategies seem to differ. Uh, when looking at the long ter their long-term memories for their past emotional reactions, positive reappraisal was more adaptive than disengagement strategies. Okay, so to sum up, emotion and cognition are closely interwoven throughout the lifespan, so changing cognition is a really key pathway to changing emotion. Infants and toddlers' emotional reactions change 
as their developmental, as their cognitive development allows for increasingly complex appraisals of events. And cognition continues to play an important role as children learn deliberate strategies for changing their emotions. At least by five or six, young children understand that you can use a range of cognitive strategies in order to change emotion. Which of these strategies is most effective? Emotion educators, clinicians, and researchers often focus on the disadvantages of disengagement, and they instead favor coaching children to identify and work through negative emotions. But we found that despite the bad rap that disengagement has gotten, uh, when non-emotional matters demand attention, children asked to disengage from mild negative emotions are able to do so and with positive results for their learning. So strategies like thought suppression, distraction, and distancing can be effective tools for cutting short the appraisal process that elicits and maintains an emotional reaction. And working through negative emotion didn't have this positive effect. Now, this is not to say that emotional disengagement is in general a healthy and effective strategy. Suppressing emotional reactions to ongoing and traumatic events can prolong people's distress. This is also not to say that emotional engagement is ineffective. The benefits of working through feelings seems to take time to emerge. For instance, reappraising a stressful situation was associated with later remembering it as a happier experience than it actually was. And over the long run, this should encourage children to take on new challenges and promote their success. So although emotional engagement strategies turn out to be effortful in the short run, in the long run, they're well worth the effort. What we conclude then is that children ought to be encouraged to become proficient in a wide range of strategies for changing their emotions including thought suppression, distraction, and distancing. Rather than viewing strategies as good or bad, our research forces us to evaluate them in a broad context. A strategy that's harmful in one set of circumstances might be ideally suited to another. So within this broader context, the Stoics' contentions have merit. Disengaging from emotion temporarily can help children keep their cool and concentrate on learning until they have the time and resources to use strategies like positive reappraisal that are more adaptive in the long run. So thanks so much for listening, and I would be delighted to take any questions. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm Geraldine, and thank you so much. Very informative. And I always thought uh, that that do which doesn't kill you will make you stronger or something like that. And yes, and I thought that we experience situations painful, but sometimes to grow. And I'm thinking maybe it's when we say, oh, and then we become happy. Oh, I'm kind of like, oh, because of that, then I different. I I, I grew through that. But that's one thought. The other thought is, I, um, when I have gone through situations, it, it could be for a few minutes, an hour, or days, and that I kind of, we say, dwell, like, ha oh. And then there's a moment where, where it comes an aha. Mm -hmm. And I have learned to, you know, use words like, I can do it. Mm -hmm. I was born for greatness, and uh, I'm a winner. And it doesn't matter what it is, and it puts me in a different uh, um, place, mindset, yeah. that helps me move through whatever situation I am. But it's true, the memory, it's tricky, because it brings me back to relief until I make a conscious decision of shifting. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I was just kind of... Uh, Confirm and if it's on the, those lines. Thank, Thank you. you. That's that's a wonderful comment. Um, you're 
perfectly describing positive reappraisal. Uh, rethink, think, you go through stressful experiences, but you think about how can I grow from this? What good can come out of this? And, and what the research shows is that simply reliving a stressful experience, thinking about it, feeling, um, you know, thinking about how miserable you are, it's called rumination and it's associated with depression. But what really seems to work is that shifting you're talking about. That is, if you can look at the same situation but get a new perspective on it. And, and that is really helpful. So I agree totally with what you said. I, I have a question about the relationship between disengagement and denial because you were mm. talking about the, uh, the goal orientation or, or the emphasis on goals and achievement. And it would seem to me that in families where there is a tremendous pressure on the child to achieve, that the child would very early on learn that they would reach their goals by what you call disengagement and I might call denial of emotion. Mm -hmm. And that would have long-term effects on behavior in later life. Right. Um, if you only allow disengagement and you don't, and, and, and parents are not accepting of children's feelings, that has negative consequences. So the point I was trying to say is not that everybody should get their kids to suppress their emotional experiences, but that children can come to understand that, yes, I can distract myself, yes, I can tolerate this for now and realize I'm going to deal with it later. But then the parent has to come back and, and talk to the kid about how they're feeling and why they're feeling that way and what they can do. So really, it's a combination of the two strategies. And just relying on one or the other isn't so effective. So that's a good point. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. OK, thank, thank you. Thank all of you for your great questions. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you. Thanks so much. I know we wish we could ask more questions. I don't know, Thanks. Linda, if you've been, um, been informed about all of us going to Starbucks afterwards, but if you do have some time, many of us do meet at Starbucks. And we, I know from this room, from this reaction, that there's a lot of questions people have to ask, so it would be so much fun to meet with you there. <laughs>